This is a download from BFM 89.9, the business station. This is Resource Center on Enterprise, and I'm Lim Sun Heng. We all want to live in smart cities, creative cities, cities that offer us whatever we want, cities that allow us a quality of life we desire. Robert Olette, founder and editor in chief of Mesh Cities, M E S H Cities.com, an online initiative dedicated to distributing smart city solutions. Now, Robert, you're an alumnus of the University of Toronto John H. Daniels Faculty of Architecture, Landscape and Design. That's right? That, that is correct. So how does that inform what you are doing in the context of smart cities? The thing about smart cities, which I call the first generation of intelligent cities, with mesh cities being the second or even the third generation, uh, is that mesh cities unites the a series of different influences from design, which uh, is what a architecture school and urban design school is about, to other things like technology, like information technology, mobile phone technology, the so-called Internet of Things um, technologies, and public policy. And all those things together are the driving forces for change in uh, the modern 21st century city. Now, you, you, your organization and the publication is called MESH, and you ha- it's an acronym. Now, tell us about this acronym and how that, you know, what it stands for and how that fits into your MESH cities. Right. Well, MESH, I was looking for a way to try to convey the idea of what a complex uh, city is in, in the 21st century. And in the information technology world, there are networks called mesh networks that are self-organizing. So if you have routers and uh, uh, equipment, they can talk to each other Mm -hmm. in real time and set up uh, kind of an impromptu network. And it's a really good metaphor, if you use it uh, as an acronym, to talk about what's happening happening in a 21st century city because the speed of change of cities is so rapid, it's uh, quite impressive. So MESH is an acronym that stands for mobile, which refers to things like our mobile phones, our smartphones, which are becoming uh, ubiquitous. Everyone has them now and everyone uses them for day-to-day uh, information and navigating the city and a whole host of things. Does that mobile also refer to the mobility of physical mobility of people within the city, getting from one place to another? Well, a- absolutely. And I think that's a, a very good point that um, we are not static objects in the cities. We are, you know, we're people. We u- we're citizens. We use the city. We define the city. And anything that can help us better use the city, any tool, like in the case I'm talking about, the, this uh, network of mobile technologies from, from routers uh, to your tablets. Mobile, yeah, tablets to your <laughs> mobile phone, help us do that better. A- and that's what the M in MESH stands for, mobile. The uh, e, e in MESH is efficient, which simply means we hear so often about the concept of sustainable cities. And there are many initiatives and technologies that work together to uh, make cities, well, in fact, anywhere, uh, more sustainable, use less energy, be more efficient, and have less of a footprint on on the earth. Um, so in the context of mesh cities, efficiency is a integral component of, of um, the forces of change in cities today. But hand in hand with that efficiency is uh, the S in mesh, which is subtle. Which came as a surprise to me, like, oh, how does subtle come into a city? <laughs> well, it's a, it's a very important thing. And if, if you take a moment to think about it, you'll recognize that any advanced technology or system that we used in in a city, like uh, if you live in Paris or London or Toronto or New York, a subway system or a train system or airports, uh, for example, are very complex. 
Yet, if they work very well, extremely well, and you can uh, use them without thinking about them, uh, they become subtle uh, technology. Uh, so kind of something in the background, and it, you, you use without even thinking about using them. That that's exactly right. So the. So I would argue, and I think other people argue as well, or maintain that um, good cities and good technologies are technologies that are so ingrained with what we want and our desires and patterns of use that they become secondhand and disappear after a while. Hence, subtle. And your final one, H, heuristic, which again, yeah, another word that kind of lapped up in me is, huh? Heuristic cities? Well, heuristics are, uh, you know, it's, a, it, it's not a, exactly a, an easy word, but it's a, v- a very descriptive word of how, w- it, when faced with complex situations or problems, we use rules of thumb to try to understand them and then over time improve the problem, maybe eradicate the problem. So a city that as part of its design allows for the way for continuous improvement is a city that is thinking about how heuristics work. I'm really quite interested in that simply because I want to see a model what is something that is built into the city that allows it to self-explore, question, and therefore improve? Well, and that's absolutely a good question and a critical question. And it's not, unfortunately, obvious. Because when you're faced with uh, what my colleague Bruce Mao would describe as massive change, uh, change happens so quickly that we don't have obvious or immediate solutions to deal with that change. So the nice thing about heuristics is that it doesn't assume you already know what the answer is. It assumes that you have ways to approach coming up with answers or solutions over time, which which is very good. And I'll, I can elaborate on a particular example that we used in Toronto for a heuristic approach to a, a, a pretty important uh, problem. Uh, Jill would like to hear that. Okay. Um, a few years ago, and um, I, I'm not sure of the culture here in Malaysia, but in uh, in Canada and North America, New Year's Eve is a very important date. Same here. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, so January 31st, my wife and I wanted to leave the car at home. We have a car, but we don't drive it that much. We wanted to use the the Toronto Transit Commission, a subway and buses to get to an event we were going to. And we went online thinking we should be able to find an easy way to get from where we were in the city to where we wanted to be. But it turned out that for a number of reasons for, uh, you know, due to economics, due to kind of a political inertia or a, you know, a, a lack of an willingness in an organization to change, to, to deal with problems, we found there was no way to get this information on the website. So the next day, using my role as I uh, was an urban design and architecture critic for one of Canada's big newspapers. But as well, I also had a blog, you know, which I'm sure... So you wrote about it. In Malaysia, <laughs> I wrote about this problem. And not only did I write about it, I, I gave a challenge. As part of this heuristic, I said, I can complain, we can all complain, but let's go beyond that. Let's use this way of problem solving to see what we can do. And um, a lot of people now have heard the idea of crowdsourcing mm. to get solutions to complex problems that sometimes problems the answer to problems isn't obvious and if you get a lot of people thinking about what that problem may be uh, the trend is that you can actually get better answers than sometimes professionals can uh, come up with so I put a challenge out to the TTC management, but also to city politicians, the people in charge of that uh, function of Mm. that piece of the city infrastructure. And I said, this is wrong. We can fix it and we will work with you. We will go out to our readers 
and as well the readers of other affiliated blog sites and publication sites and ask them what they think you should do to solve the problems. And the, um, the remarkable thing about this was that in, within two weeks, we had not only the politicians on our side and the, uh, the managers of the very complex transit system, uh, but we also had hundreds if not thousands of um, readers and a lot of whom were young developers, digital software mm -hmm. developers, who came out and started giving very specific uh, information about how the problem could be solved. So the model that, that you've come up with essentially is crowdsource for solutions. So anytime there is a, a social issue or a anything that, that's within the city that needs fixing and we are not sure of the answers or we think that there might be just more than one answer out there, we crowdsource for the answers. W again, and crowdsourcing is only one part of this general, uh, under the general umbrella of heuristics, but it's a very powerful tool. And it's so powerful that in a month, and Toronto is no different than any other big city, politicians move slowly, big uh, bureaucracies move slowly. It's, it's impossible <laughs> oh to get them to oh respond. <laughs> However, within a month, we had the politicians sitting down with the managers of the Toronto Transit Commission and literally hundreds of young developers who were working, you know, uh, for free, for free, <laughs> uh, trying to solve these problems because they used the transit system. They were, you know, they were the students, the the people who were in their early employment history, and that's how they get around the city. So they were very motivated. I mean, it struck me that you, you drew public attention to an issue, and therefore it gave the politicians the political will to, get, to bring a solution to it. Exactly, mm. and, and of course, because media tends to work in a certain way, that normally media points out the faults and things, and what generally happens is that um, whoever they're uh, pointing their finger at, their, you know, the, their print finger at or their television finger or radio finger at, will try to defend their position. So this is different. This is where we say, look it, let's work together to solve the problem. So it gives these people a way out and it makes them, I think, look good. In fact, it makes them look so good that after a month, we came up with solutions. And that year, uh, a very eminent publication, Harvard Business Review, mm. came out and said that um, Transit Camp, as this initiative came to be called, was one of the best new business ideas of 2008. So very impressive indeed and it was you know uh, to use one of those business buzzwords it was a win-win situation all around robert olette founder and editor-in-chief of meshcities.com coming up what does kl need this is resource center on enterprise bfm 89.9 the business station thank you for listening to this podcast to find more great interviews go to bfm.my or find us on itunes BFM 89.9, The Business Station.